Ladies uh, and gentlemen, we are in Romans chapter 12 this morning, and I'd love to begin by reading Romans chapter 12. Uh, We're going to look at verses 3 through 8 this morning. And as you begin to see, starting last week, Romans chapters 1 through 11 were really this huge, complete, uh, uh, in-depth look at our faith, at the gospel, at how Jesus has done his complete work. And it's been like, at times, really intense, right? So we've moved from that, of this, this full understanding of who we are uh, as followers of, followers of Jesus, by faith, in grace, by the work of, complete work of Jesus Christ, we're now following him. And now it's really turned to the, 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 the nitty gritty, the practical of how now we shall live as followers of Jesus with one another in the body of Christ. And it gets really, really practical for us now. And over the next several weeks, it'll just continue to be one thing. Out of how do we love one another as followers of Jesus? And so this morning, we continue that theme. And I know we're going to pick up in verse 3. You can pull that up now. But I want to I start with verses 1 and 2. So listen to verses 1 and 2. Because 1 and 2 then inform what we talked about last week. Informs what we're going to be discussing and, and uh, diving into this week. So verses 1 and 2 say this. Therefore, I urge you, if you remember this from last week. I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. Holy, pleasing to God. And this is your true and proper worship. Don't, don't be conformed to the patterns of this world. But rather be transformed by the renewing of your mind, then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Those are verse one and two. And now for this week, verses three through eight, and it says this, four, for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought but rather, think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just, verse 4, for just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ, circle in Christ, because that's the key to understanding all of this, so now in Christ, we, the body, through many, form one body, and each member belongs to all of the others. You see, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's encouraging, then in, uh, if it's to encourage, then give encouragement. If it's to give, then give generously. If it's to lead, do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. And Paul dives into what is commonly known as in the, in the church as spiritual gifts. And he gives us this cross section of, of what, what we typically refer to as spiritual gifts. And there's a few different places in scripture that uh, give us a, 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 a larger picture of what, our, what spiritual gifts are and, and how the different types of them. And here in Romans chapter 12, he gives us uh, kind of an abbreviated list of some of the spiritual gifts that are given to the body of Christ. And I think when we talk about, so today is all about spiritual gifts, and I think when we start to talk about spiritual gifts and, and, and think about how we apply them, what they are, how they work, kind of those things, we tend to get some misperceptions in this world, in this church oftentimes. And, and we tend to think about spiritual gifts in terms of this spectrum. And for the purposes of today, we'll go to the, the far end of the spectrum. And on the far end of the spectrum on this end, it's the person who says, I, there is no way I am gifted enough to be here, right? I'm gonna, for the purposes of today, we're going to call that the Frodo syndrome, Okay. Remember Frodo? Frodo was the guy that was like, oh, why? I wish this would have not been me. I can't do it. And the Lord of the Rings, he was constantly going on and on, right? I wish this, I just don't have what it takes. And then Gandalf's like, you and everybody else, bud. It's not for us to decide. So on the, on the one end, we commonly see oftentimes people in the church going, I don't, I don't, I'm not gifted. What are you talking about? I'm the opposite of gifted. I don't even deserve to be here. There's no reason for me to be here. And we kind of, we kind of 
disassociate ourselves and, and cut ourselves off. I'm not, I'm, I'm not gifted enough to be here. Well, then there's the people on the other end of the spectrum. Right? right. <laughs> They're the folks that kind of say, I am way too gifted to be here. <laughs> That's not you. I'm talking about your friends, right? But they, they, these are the folks, and for, this, for, this, uh, for the purpose of this spectrum illustration, I, I would refer to these people like this. The Black Knight. So let me tell you about the Black Knight. So the Black Knight was a, was a character in a movie way back when, I kind of, I'm kind of dating myself, called Monty Python on the Holy Grail. So, and the, and the, and the story of Monty Python on the Holy Grail uh, the, the guy in dressed in white, that's King Arthur. And, and he and his, and his knights of the round table are on the search for the Holy Grail. That's the movie title. And he comes across a man called the Black Knight who's guarding the entrance to, uh, of a bridge. And he comes up and the knight says, none shall pass. And King Arthur's like, oh, yes, I will. And they get into an altercation. And the Black Knight attacks King Arthur and he cuts off his right arm. And which the Black Knight responds, Anybody? Tis merely a flesh wound. You're right. Okay. And so then, with one arm cut off, he starts flailing his sword at King Arthur once again. In which case, King Arthur cuts off his other arm. Says, King Arthur politely says, Now, m much ado, sir, I'm going to go on my way. And the next thing you know, the guy's headbutting him on the side. He, and King Arthur replies, what are you going to do? Bleed on me? What's the matter here? And the guy continues to attack him, so he ends up cutting off another uh, a leg. And now he's hopping on one foot, saying, is that all you got? I'm the Black Knight, right? And then he comes at him, and he cuts off both legs. And finally, he's left with no arms and no legs on the ground. And as King Arthur walks past him on his way, the Black Knight is going, what, you're going to run? That's all you've got? And he still considers himself the greatest knight in the world. I think sometimes I'm guilty of kind of feeling that way. It's just a one-man army or the total package. I think sometimes we, we, are, we are tempted to want to strive to, or think that we should be the total package of Christianity, champion for Christ. And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. There's a spectrum, and we know that that's not achievable when we're honest with ourselves, right? Like the Black Knight Syndrome is just stop. Um, there's no way I'm going to get there. And we know that on this side, this like, woe is me, Frodo syndrome, that's probably not healthy too. And we tend to think that then there's this spectrum that we're trying to live on and we, and we try to actually stay in that spectrum but be somewhere in the middle, right? On one end, you're, you, you're left really isolated and alone. On the other end, you're left desperately scared of fail, fear of failure. And so we try to live somewhere in the middle of that spectrum where it's like, well, I don't want to live completely alone, but I also don't want to live like scared to try anything. So I'm just going to try to stay in the middle. What if there was a better way? Completely off that spectrum. You see, the gospel is completely off of the Frodo Black Knight spectrum. <laughs> it's completely different. It's completely different. He completely removes us from that works-based, gotta earn my way through it, gotta look good, gotta act the right way. If I just say it, he, he, he takes us out of that. And he frees us to live the way that we were meant to live in this beautiful organism called the body, the church. And he says here, he gives us this insight into how we begin to function, how we have form, how we fit together as the body of Christ here in Romans chapter 12. And he begins in verse 3 by beginning to to give context to how we operate in this. And he calls it sober judgment. Now, in moving off of this spectrum where we're, we're, living, in, uh, we're, we're living in things like pride, self-pride or self-loathing, and both of them kind of end in self-isolation or self-doubt, it kind of makes us just go, I don't know what to do. I'm just, I'm just going to lay in bed. <laughs> 
and wait for next year. You've been there. Okay, me too. And the gospel moves us out of that, and he begins by saying the same word twice in verse 3. He says, for the, for the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, don't think, right? Think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment. And the word think is repeated. That word think is the link to verses one and two. So how now are we thinking from last week? We know that we're thinking with now the mind of Christ, with our minds renewed. And, when, and in this renewed mind, it begins to reshape how we think, not only about the Father or each other, but also about ourselves. And he goes, hey, with renewed minds, now you need to think. And he says, we think now with this thing called sober judgment. Not self-pride, not self-loathing, not isolation, not self-doubt, but sober judgment. It's this gospel humility. Tim Keller explains it like this, uh, that humility isn't just simply thinking less of yourself. I'm sorry, isn't thinking less of yourself. It's the freedom to simply think of yourself less. He's beginning to put ourselves aside. And he says, with these re renewed minds, we begin to, to think in accordance with two things. And he says it right here. In accordance with the faith that God has given us. Let's see, that's in verse 3. In accordance to the faith that God has given us. And then in verse 6, with the grace. In accordance with the grace that he has also given us. So with renewed minds, we, in that mind of Christ, we can begin to think when this, in this full, just kind of sober judgment where we're not constantly thinking about ourselves. It just means that we get to think about him more. So sober judgment is the grace given, faith filled self awareness of who we are in Christ. Remember we circled in Christ because in Christ is the key. Sober judgment is the grace-given, faith-filled self-awareness of who we are in Christ. Now with these renewed minds, we begin to move forward. Key to understanding our spiritual giftedness is the realization that those spiritual gifts are really not about us. They're about him. They're about God, not me. And so, this morning, we get to begin to really unwrap in that context with now these renewed minds in Christ with sober judgment, we get to unwrap what spiritual gifts are. Because I think so often when we talk about the spiritual gifts, we think of them as being very mysteri myster uh, mysterious and kind of lofty, and they just kind of float out there somewhere between heaven and earth. And we kind of we either can't grasp them and we're like, ah, I, don't, I don't get it. Or we think that we really grasp them all and we think, yeah, listen, I got it. Either way, it's like, oh, let's just unwrap these because what I want you to know is spiritual gifts are so practical to how we live, to how we function as followers of Jesus. So this morning, we're going to look at how spiritual gifts are given how they are for growing and how they are for glorifying. Spiritual gifts are given, they're growing, and they're glorifying. So the first one, spiritual gifts are given, they're given, not earned. And as we read through Romans 12, we begin to see like the, the spiritual gifts that he's talking about are given, they're gifts, right? I, what happens if you pay for a gift? It's not a gift, right? It's something that is received, that is, that is entrusted to us by the Holy Spirit. So the first thing is the spiritual gifts are given to followers of Jesus, not earned. And they're given personally. We kind of flew through it, but I, I don't want you to miss this part. Spiritual gifts are given to every believer. Every follower of Jesus has been given at least one spiritual gift. Go back to verse 3. For the grace given to me, I say to how many of you? The, the really, the re super spiritual ones? The ones that really know? No, 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 no. Given to every one of you. Every stinking one of you. Do not think of yourselves more highly, but rather think of yourselves in sober, sober, sober judgment. But, uh, in accordance with the faith God has distributed to some of you, to each one of you. 
So, okay, so let's just stop right there. That means that when we, by faith, receive Christ, say, yes, I'm going to follow you, and he, that Holy Spirit, comes in, and our minds are renewed, and, and our hearts are transformed, and, and the Holy Spirit is in us. That means that he gives, he gifts us, and trusts us with spiritual gifts. You have been, as a follower of Jesus, you have been given a spiritual gift. That's the first thing. So stop disqualifying yourself. 1 Corinthians 12 is another uh, place where 1 Corinthians 12 and 13 really kind of mirror Romans 12 and 13 a little bit. And it says in, in 1 Corinthians 12, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit, the Holy Spirit, capital S, distributes them. And, and here we see it. It's, just to, it's, it's to everyone. So they're given personally. And then secondly, they're given particularly. So gifts aren't given out of random. This isn't like a spiritual goodie bag that you get at a party and you just don't know what's going to come out. God isn't like throwing dice to see which one you're going to get. No, 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 no. That's not how spiritual gifts work. 1 Corinthians 12, 18 says, but in fact, God has placed the parts in the body He's talking about the church, but in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. He has uniquely and specifically gifted you, distributed by God through the work of his Holy Spirit living inside you, but, also, but given them especially to you for such a time that he has determined. They are on purpose, okay? So you're not only gifted, you've been gifted for a purpose. And that's good. Dude. Okay. So first of all, spiritual gifts are given, not earned, through the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. They're, pers- they're given personally and they're given particularly. Secondly, we learn that spiritual gifts are for growing, not getting Let's go back to verse 4 and 5. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not have all the same function, so speaking of the physical body, so in Christ, key, we through many, many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. So secondly, spiritual gifts are for growing and not getting. Specifically, they're for growing the church, the body of Christ. That means that We are not complete when we are pulled apart and we're separated. It means that in Christ, we are all together necessary in form and fit and function. It's beautiful. They're practical gifts that strengthen and grow the church according to God's design. He made it that way. He calls us to it. We belong to one another like a hand belongs to the arm. Uh, if you want to f- fully function as, this, as members, here, look, look for these three opportunities just as part of the church. One, look to serve sacrificially. Look for a place to give, to serve. Secondly, give generously, freely. And then thirdly, connect relationally as you begin to f- function as fully functioning members of the church. Be engaged. So they're grown purposefully and then they're grown practicably. You see, we're given gifts and then we are called to steward those gifts. You know what a steward is? Steward's a a term that kind of looks back, kind of, but we don't have typically stewards in America right now, but think of like uh, uh, a person who is the steward of a castle in Scotland. So Scotland has a, 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 a family who owns the castle. They're gone. And while they are away, the steward is the caretaker of the property of the king. We're given these gifts, but we're also called to steward them. That means we're we're called that they grow, that they develop, it means that they cultivate, we're, we're called to cultivate those gifts inside of us. It means our personal faith is never meant to be solitary or alone. It means that, man, we can't allow our friends to become separated, to fall away. We have to pursue one another, call us back in, 
connect us back in the community. We need each other in this grand, grace-given, faith-filled practicum called the body of Christ. So therefore, uh, 1 Corinthians calls it, therefore, the common good of the church. So it's practical, it's purposeful, and it's practicable. It's meant to be put into practice. First of all, we've, we've learned that they're given, not earned. Secondly, we know that they're therefore growing, not getting. They're for the body of Christ, not for the body of Matt Vaught. Spiritual gifts are always, spiritual gifts aren't always about what we do. Oftentimes, spiritual gifts are about how we do them, Okay. So oftentimes, spiritual gifts give context to how we function and fit together. This is, uh, this is where sometimes spiritual gifts kind of get a bad rap in the church, right? Because uh, we, we, we learn our spiritual gifts, and uh, it's like, well, my spiritual gift is uh, hospitality. And, and then my wife is like... I need you to clean the toilets. And I'm like, but that's not my spiritual gift, my dear. I'm sorry. I am way too gifted for that. I'm so sorry. Kind of a big deal. It's just, I'm not built that way. I don't know. My hands don't function. Like, listen, we need people to clean toilets with your spiritual gifts. <laughs> Here's a classic example. Uh, I have a friend, his name's Stan, and Stan parks the cars on Sunday mornings out in the parking lot. You see him. He's the first face you see out of your car if you park along the stretch in the front. Stan's spiritual gift, believe it or not, is not parking cars. You know what one of his spiritual gifts is? Encouragement. So all of a sudden, thank the Lord that that's the first face you see when you get out of your car on a Sunday morning. It's a, it's a face of encouragement. Hey, you made it. You're winning already. You got here. And it's, not, it's like before 10, 15. You're ahead of the game. Good job. Hey, I'm glad you're here. Hey, we thought of you before you got here. That's what he does. You know, behind the scenes, when we're praying over Sunday morning before, we talk about often, hey, the sermon starts in the parking lot. He begins that with his team. If you have the gift of encouragement, go see Stan after this. We need people to help. It makes a difference. It's how, it, well, we're going to get to how it glorifies in a minute. It's a big deal. Okay. So spiritual gifts are for are for growing, not getting. And then thirdly, they're for glorifying. Who do they glorify? Me? No. Stan? No. No, no, no. They're for glorifying the Father. Spiritual gifts are not about us. They're about Him. When we begin to operate like this, when we fit together, when we, when we are loving one another getting people in the right seats and the, uh, in the right bus, and, and they start just thriving in that. Man, it is, there's nothing greater. It's so fun to watch, to be a part of. And you know what it does? It doesn't glorify the person that's serving or using. The, it, it brings glory to the one who gave the gift in the first place, doesn't it? And because our spiritual gifts are not about us, that means that it's not about how we feel fulfilled or capable or even appreciated or special or loved or useful. No, no, no. Spiritual gifts are not about that because it's not about me. It's about him. So it frees us off of that spectrum. We just step, we just step away from that. And this sober judgment is like, it's not about me. It's not about my kingdom. It's about his. It frees us up to walk with faith and grace. Spiritual gifts are for glorifying, not gloating. They're also not, spiritual gifts 
Uh, sometimes here's another one that we get confused on. Spiritual gifts are not a sign of spiritual maturity. Spiritual fruit is. Okay? So Galatians tells us that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Those flow out of a, of, a, of a mature follower of Jesus, somebody who's growing up in their faith, okay? So it's not like it's like, uh, sorry, my spiritual gift is not kindness, so I get to be a jerk. Sorry. No, 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 no. It's a sign of just immaturity, right? Now, we're called to grow up. We're called to function in, in our spiritual gifts, but we are also called to live out of the fruit of the Spirit, of that Christ-likeness getting poured out of us, okay? Here's another example. I have a friend. Her name is Meredith. I've known Meredith for a long time. Meredith has, has uh, uh, some giftings that she's really strong in. Uh, um, administration is a spiritual gift. She's a strong in administration, discernment, and hospitality. I would, I would, I would say they're kind of her top three spiritual gifts. Um, not one of her spiritual gifts is mercy, okay? Uh, it's not a, that's not a knock. It, or, that's just not one of them. Like, she's strong in over here, but not necessarily over there. Okay. She works for an organization. She's the, she's the help, helpline manager at RARA, Rockbridge Area Relief Association. And I'm going to tell you what. Like when she serves in, those, in that giftedness of who she is, it's the perfect place for her. You know, like if she was actually flip-flopped and her greatest gift was mercy, her, that job where she was, where she is right now, kind of eat her alive. It would, just, it, would, it would just wear her out. But she's it's just in this great spot where she can thrive in the place that God has placed her to be. And she's a representative of Jesus there in the workplace where we live, work, and play. Like she is a follower of him. Now, what's also taking place is she's a mature Christian. So she's also functioning in the fruit of the spirit. So she does walk with things like joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control, right? So she's, she's a mature Christian and also finding her place. Is that kind of making sense? I'm trying to give like kind of some tangible ways that this starts to play out in the body is what I'm saying. Spiritual gifts are the means by which we love one another, are a means by which we love one another and glorify God. So spiritual gifts are then given by the Holy Spirit for the growing of the body of Christ and the glorifying of our Heavenly Father. So that frames for us then, as it gives us just solid context from our starting point, okay, from why they exist, okay? They're given by the Holy Spirit, they're not for myself, they're for us, the body, the, the church coming together, the full expression of the body of Christ. And they're to glorify God and ourselves. Now, how on earth do I begin to learn my spiritual gifts and function in them is the next question, right? There's four steps you can begin to do. Number one, pray. Shocker. <laughs> pray. Number two, discern. Number three, confirm. Number four, practice. Okay? Pray, discern, confirm, practice. Number one, begin with prayer. Are you, have you asked, God, what do you got? <laughs> have an honest conversation with God. You know what that does? It causes us to check our motives at the door. Am I seeking his kingdom or my own? is the question. Because let's be honest, we are, I've heard it said, we are idle factories, aren't we? Let me show you what I mean. If you ever see this as a uh, commercial for Rockbridge Church, (laughs) fire me, please. (laughs) That... Whoa, don't applaud me getting fired. <laughs> Wrong time to applaud. I, I, this is ridiculous, but it is so true, right? Like we are idle factories. We love to make it about something other than God's kingdom. And we love to build our own. And church, this is not 
Church. <laughs> this is Matt Vaught. Rockbridge Church is not about this ever, okay? Don't let it be. I am completely incomplete apart from Stan and Meredith and Dan Sanders. With those three, we can conquer the world. Okay. <laughs> can you take that off the screen, please? <laughs> Thank you. Golly. All right. Ask the Father, am I, Lord, help me to see your kingdom and not my own. Just a great place to start. That, 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 that awareness, that self-awareness of who we are fully in Christ. Okay. It's not about me. Start there. Number two, discern with discipline. Uh, if, you, if you've never taken a spiritual gift assessment, take one. We actually, do we have a slide for that? Get your phones out. It's a theme, I guess. Week two of getting your phones out. Get your phones out and hit this QR code. Man, it'll take 10, 15 minutes. Not right now. Maybe after we say amen. Um, take this survey. It's a great starting point. Just like, just start to build. It has a list of many, you know, 20 or so probably spiritual gifts that you can begin just to make heads or tails of. What am I good at? What am I not? It's a great just starting point. I would say it's, it's the starting point, not the end point, okay? So after you start to discern this, the third thing you do is be, have it be confirmed in community. So begin to ask, man, who are two or three other trustworthy followers of Jesus who walk in the fruit of the Spirit who could help bring understanding to how this fits in my life, kind of these natural or, and God-given gifts that he's given to me. So how has God uniquely shaped me, molded me, and passioned me? How am I growing and positioning for such a time as this that he's placed me here for? Is, how is it going to be for his kingdom, not my own? And then thirdly, who, uh, who are two or, just two or three others who I can just begin to just converse with, bounce out, hey, what do you think? Uh, this is saying this. Uh, do you see that in my life? What? Maybe not. Maybe so. Like, like, have it be confirmed in community. And then fourthly, do something. <laughs> Just do something. Start. These are going to be practiced, okay? So these, you grow these. You cultivate your spiritual gifts. Where might timing, positioning, giftedness intersect things like need, opportunity, and function in the body of Christ? And here's the thing. We start to do something. The gospel moves. It advances. God's kingdom grows. It becomes more about prayer than pride. It becomes about discerning, not loathing. We walk in community, not isolation. We can freely be about God's work and doing instead of constantly doubting. So what's your spiritual gift? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for you, that you have particularly, perfectly, uniquely gifted us to function together as the body of Christ. And Lord, would that be healthy? And Lord, I, Lord would you, you allow us to do things like park cars and clean toilets and have them glorify you? Lord, would you allow us to, uh, to practically live out what one anothering in the body of Christ is. Father, we, we just as followers of you just now just pray that you would help us invite our friends who, who, may, who might find themselves still trying to step back in to community. Father, help us to invite them, to bring them back. Lord, we pray for those who, who haven't yet professed you. Lord, would they just come to trust you that your, ba that your ways are better than theirs? Or would you, by your Holy Spirit, graciously call all of us to yourself? Father, it is not about our kingdom. It is about yours. Would you help us to live with form and fit and function as members? 
together. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Guys.